the workshop. Tonight we are happy to bring you a condensed version of Shakespeare's As You Like It. The production will be directed by one of the great talents of the English-speaking stage, Margaret Webster. Miss Webster is known to many millions of American theater goers as an actress of front-rank ability and is equally familiar to the profession itself as a director. New York has seen her skill demonstrated in the Maurice Evans successes Henry IV, Richard II, and more recently Hamlet. During the past year at the New York World's Fair, Miss Webster's direction of the Globe Theater Group was responsible for a great portion of the success of that delightful spot called Merry England. Miss Webster's characterization last year of Magdalene in the Broadway play Family... The Columbia Workshop. Tonight we are happy to bring you a condensed version of Shakespeare's As You Like It. The production will be directed by one of the great talents of the English-speaking stage, Margaret Webster. Miss Webster is known to many millions of American theater goers as an actress of front-rank ability and is equally familiar to the profession itself as a director. New York has seen her skill demonstrated in the Maurice Evans successes Henry IV, Richard II, and more recently Hamlet. During the past year at the New York World's Fair, Miss Webster's direction of the Globe Theater Group was responsible for a great portion of the success of that delightful spot called Merry England. Miss Webster's characterization last year of Magdalene in the Broadway play Family Portrait will be long remembered. This evening, she will be heard in the role of Rosalind. The Columbia Workshop brings you now Shakespeare's As You Like It with Margaret Webster. <laughs> The story of As You Like It concerns two brothers, the elder of whom, Duke of a French province, was deposed and banished by his younger brother, Frederick. At the opening of the play, Rosalind, daughter of the banished Duke, is living at her uncle Frederick's court as companion to his own daughter, Celia. A young man, Orlando, by his bravery in a wrestling match held before the court, attracts the attention of Duke Frederick and the admiration of the girls. The Duke, however, on learning that Orlando is the son of a nobleman who had been a close friend to the banished Duke, becomes enraged and sends Orlando away. His rage turns against Rosalind as well, since she is a constant reminder of the ill treatment he afforded his brother, and he banishes her in turn. Celia, after vainly pleading for Rosalind, decides to join her in a search for her father, the banished Duke, in the forest of Arden, where the exiles fleet the time carelessly as they did in the Golden Age. Since it would be unsafe for two young women to travel in the forest, they disguise themselves as a young countryman and a country girl, pretending that they are brother and sister. Meanwhile, Orlando, to escape the threat of his cruel brother Oliver's envy and malice, has also come to the forest of Arden. He comes upon the banished Duke and his party, who are just about to eat their dinner. Slow, slow the winter wind Thou art not so unkind Thou art not so unkind As man's ingratitude Thy tooth is not so keen Because thou art Crewmates and brothers in exile, hath not old custom made this life more sweet than that of painted pomp? Are not these woods more free from peril than the envious court? Sweet are the uses of adversity, which, like the toad, ugly and venomous, wears yet a precious jewel in his head. And this, our life, exempt from public haunt, finds tongues in trees, books in the running brooks, Sermons in stones, and good in everything. Forbear, and eat no more. Why, I have eaten none yet. Forbear, I say. 
He dies that touches any of this fruit to lie, and my affairs are answered. And you will not be answered with reason. I must die. Peace, Jaquiz. What would you have? Your gentleness shall force more than your force move us to gentleness. I almost die for food. And let me have it. Sit down and feed. And welcome to our table. Speak you so gently. Pardon me, I pray you. I thought that all things had been savage here. But whate'er you are, that in this desert inaccessible lose and neglect the creeping hours of time. If ever you have looked on better days, if ever been where bells had knolled to church, if ever sat at any good man's feast and know what tis to pity and be pitied, let gentleness my strong enforcement be. Welcome. Fall to. <laughs> I will not trouble you as yet to question you about your fortune. Jaquiz, thou seest we are not all alone unhappy. This wide and universal theater presents more woeful pageants than the scene wherein we play in. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. At first the infant, mewling and puking in the nurse's arms, and then the whining schoolboy with his satchel and shining morning face, creeping like snail unwillingly to school. And then the lover, sighing like furnace, with a woeful ballad made to his mistress' eyebrow. Then a soldier, full of strange oaths and bearded like the pard, jealous in honor, sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation even in the cannon's mouth. And then the justice, in fair round belly with good cape and line, with eyes severe and beard of formal cut, full of wise saws and modern instances. And so he plays his part. The sixth age shifts into the lean and slippered pantaloon with spectacles on nose and pouch on side, his youthful hose well saved, a world too wide for his shrunk shank, and his big manly voice turning again toward childish treble, pipes and whistles in his sound. Last scene of all that ends this strange eventful history is second childishness and mere oblivion. Sans teeth, sans taste, sans eyes, sans everything. <laughs> Jupiter, how weary are my spirits. I care not for my spirits if my legs were not weary. I tell thee, Celia, I could find in my heart to disgrace my man's apparel and to cry like a woman. I pray you, cousin, bear with me. I can go no further. Well, Touchstone, this is the forest of Arden. Aye, now am I in Arden, the more fool I. When I was at home, I was in a better place. But travelers must be content. I be so good, Touchstone. I pray you, one of you question your man. If he for gold will give us any food, I faint almost to death. <clears throat> I, uh, pretty shepherd, if that love or gold can in this desert place buy entertainment, bring us where we may rest ourselves and feed. I am shepherd to another man. My master is of churlish disposition. Besides, his coat, his flocks and bounds of feed are now on sale, and at our sheep cut now, by reason of his absence, there is nothing that you will feed on. I pray thee, if it stand with honesty, buy thou the cottage pasture and the flock, and thou shalt have to pay for it of us. And we will mend thy wages. I like this place, and willingly could waste my time in it. I will your very faithful feeder be, and buy it with your gold right suddenly. Let no face be kept in mind but the fair of Rosaline. Hang there, my verse, in witness of my love. And thou thrice-crowned queen of night, Survey with thy chaste eye from thy pale sphere above thy huntress name that my full life doth sway. <laughs> run, run, Orlando, carve on every tree the fair, the chaste, and unexpressive she. Why should this a desert be? For it is unpeopled? No, tongues I'll hang on every tree. 
that shall civil fain show. But upon the fairest bows, or at every sentence end, will I, Rosalinda Wright. Oh, most gentle pulpit. Rosalind. What tedious homily of love have you wearied your parishioners with all, and never cried, have patience, good people. Try you who have done this. Is it a man? And a chain that you once wore about his neck. Ah, oh. change you color? I prithee who? Oh, wonderful, wonderful, and most wonderful, wonderful, and yet again, wonderful. And after that, out of all hooping. Good, my complexion. Dost thou think though I am comparisoned like a man, I have a doublet and hose in my disposition? I prithee take the cork out of thy mouth that I may drink thy tidings. It is young Orlando that has tripped up the wrestler's heels and your heart, both in an instant. Orlando? Orlando. Alas, the day, what shall I do with my doublet and hose? What did he when I saw him? What said he? How looked he? Where and went he? What makes he here? Did he ask for me? Where remains he? How parted he with thee? And when shall I see him again? Answer me in one word. Oh, you must borrow me gargantua's mouth first. To the word too great for any mouth of this age's size. I found him under a tree, like a dropped acorn. It may well be called Joe's tree when it drops forth such fruit. Give me audience, good madam. Proceed. He was furnished like a hunter. Oh, ominous. He comes to kill my heart. I would sing my song without a burden. That brings me out of tune. Do you not know that I am a woman? When I think, I must speak. Sweet, say I'm soft. Comes he not here? Tis he. I will speak to him like a saucy lackey. And under that habit, play the knave with him. <clears throat> Do you hear, Forrester? Very well. What would you? I pray you, um... Uh, what is the clock? You should ask me what time of day. There's no clock in the forest. Then there is no true lover in the forest. Else sighing every minute and groaning every hour would detect the lazy foot of time as well as a clock. <laughs> Where dwell you, pretty youth? With this shepherdess, my sister. Here in the skirts of the forest like fringe upon a petticoat. Are you native of this place? Your accent is something finer than you could purchase in so removed a dwelling. Uh, I have been told so of many, but that indeed an old religious uncle of mine taught me to speak who was in his youth an inland man. One that knew courtship too well. For there he fell in love. I have heard him read many lectures against it. And I thank God I am not a woman to be touched with so many giddy offenses as he hath generally taxed their whole sex with all. I prithee recount some of them. No. I will not cast away my physic, but on those that are sick. There is a man haunts the forest that abuses our young plants with carving Rosalind on their barks. Hangs oats upon hawthorns and elegies on brambles, all for suits deifying the name of Rosalind. Mm. If I could meet that fancy monger, I would give him some good counsel. I am he that is so love shaped. I pray you, tell me your remedy. Oh. Uh, there is none of my uncle's marks upon you. He taught me how to know a man in love, in which cage of rushes I'm sure you are not prisoner. What were his marks? A lean cheek, which you have not. A blue eye and sunken, which you have not. A beard neglected, which you have not. Then your hose should be unguarded, your sleeve unbuttoned, your shoe untied, everything about you demonstrating a careless desolation. But you are no such man. Fair youth, I would I could make thee believe. I love. Me? Believe it. You may as soon make her that you love believe it. Which I warrant she is after to do than to confess she does. But in good sooth, are you he that hangs the verses on the trees wherein Rosalind is so admired? I swear to the youth by the white hand of Rosalind, I am that he. That unfortunate he. But are you so much in love as your rhymes speak? Neither rhyme nor reason can express how much. Oh, Love is merely a madness, and I tell you, deserves as well a dark house and a whip as madmen do. And the reason why they are not so punished and cured is that the lunacy is so ordinary, the whippers are in love, too. <laughs> yes, I profess curing it by counsel. Did you ever cure any so? Yes, one. And in this manner. He was to imagine me his love, his mistress, and I set him every day to woo me. At which time would I, being a moonish youth... Grieve the effeminate, changeable, longing and liking, full of tears, full of smiles. Would now like him, now loathe him, now weep for him, then spit at him. And thus I cured him. And this way will I take upon me to wash your liver as clean as a sound sheep's heart. Uh, I would not be cured, you. I would cure you, if you would but call me Rosalind, and come every day to my cot and woo me. <laughs> no, by my faith, my love, I will. Uh, Tell me where it is. Go with me to it and I'll show it to you. And by the way, you shall tell me where in the forest you live. Will you go? With all my heart, could you? Nay, you must call me Rosalind. <laughs> I'm a 
place, good Audrey. I will fetch up your goats, Audrey. And how, Audrey? Am I the man yet? Doth my simple feature content you? Your features, Touchstone, Lord Warrenus. What features? Truly, I would the gods had made thee poetical. I do not know what poetical is. Is it honest in deed and word? Is it a true thing? No, truly, for the truest poetry is the most feigning. And lovers are given to poetry, and what they swear in poetry may be said as lovers they do feign. Do you wish, then, that the gods had made me poetical? I do, truly, for thou swearest to me thou art honest. Now, if thou wert a poet, I might have some hope thou didst feign. Would you not have me honest? No, truly, unless thou wert hard favored. For honesty coupled to beauty is to have honey a sauce to sugar. Well, I am not fair. Uh -uh. Therefore, I pray the gods make me honest. Truly to cast away honesty upon a foul slut were to put good meat into an unclean dish. I am not a slut. No, I thank the gods I am foul. Well, praise be the gods for thy foulness. Sluttishness may come hereafter. But be it as a baby, Audrey, I will marry thee. Well, the gods give us joy. Never talk to me, Celia, I will weep. Do I, prithee. But yet have the grace to consider that tears do not become a man. His very hair is of a dissembling color. Something broader than Judas. He says his hair is of a good color. An excellent color. Your chestnut was ever the only color. But why did he swear he would come this morning and comes not? Please, certainly there is no truth in him. Not true in love? Yes, when he is in. But I think he is not in. You have heard him swear downright he was. Was is not is. Besides, the oath of a lover is no stronger than the word of a capstone. Good day and happiness, dear Rosalind. Why, how now, Orlando? Where have you been all this while? You a lover... And you serve me such another trick, never come in my sight more. Pardon me, dear Rosalind. Nay, and you be so tardy, come no more in my sight. I'd as lief be wooed of a snail. Of a snail? I of a snail. <laughs> come, <laughs> woo me, woo me. For now am I in a holiday humor and like enough to consent. Am not I your Rosalind? I take some joy to say you are, because I would be talking of her. Well, in her person, I say I will not have you. Then in mine own person, I die. <laughs> no, Faith, die by attorney. The poor world is almost 6,000 years old, and in all this time there was not any man died in a love cause. Huh? Men have died from time to time, and worms have eaten them, but not for love. I would not have my right, Rosalind, of this mind, for I protest her frown might kill me. By this hand, it will not kill a fly. But come, now I will be your Rosalind in a more coming-on disposition. And ask me what you will, I will grant it. Then love me, Rosalind. Faith will I, Fridays and Saturdays and all. And wilt thou have me? I and twenty such. Uh, what says thou? Are you not good? I hope so. Why, then, can one desire too much of a good thing? <laughs> Come, sister, you shall be the priest and marry us. Give me your hand, Orlando. What do you say, sister? Pray thee, marry us. I cannot say the word. You must begin. Will you, Orlando? Go to. Will you, Orlando, have to wife this Rosalind? I will. Aye, but when? Why now, as fast as she can marry us. Then you must say, I take thee, Rosalind, for wife. I take thee, Rosalind, for wife. I might ask you for your commission, but I do take thee, Orlando, for my husband. <laughs> now tell me how long you would have her after you were possessed her. Forever and a day. Say a day without the ever. No, no, Orlando. Men are April when they woo, December when they wed. Maids are May when they are maids, but the sky changes when they are wives. I will be more jealous of thee than a Barbary cock pigeon over his hen. I will weep for nothing, and I will do that when you are disposed to be merry. I... But will my Rosalind do so? By my life, she will do as I do. <laughs> oh, but she is wise. Or else she could not have the wit to do this. The wiser, the waywarder. Make the doors upon a woman's wit, and it will out of the casement. Shut that, and it will out of the keyhole. Stop that... Will fly with the smoke out of the chimney. Oh. oh, for these two hours, Rosalind, I will leave thee. Alas, dear love, I cannot lack thee two hours. I must attend the Duke at dinner. By two o'clock, I will be with thee again. I go your ways, go your ways. I knew what you would prove. My friends told me as much, and I thought no less. That flattering tongue of yours won me. Tis but one cast away, and so come death. Two o'clock is your hour. Ay, sweet Rosalind. By my troth, and in good earnest, and so God mend me, and my all pretty oaths that are not dangerous, if you break one jot of your promise or come one minute behind your hour, 
I will think you the most pathetic break promise, the most hollow lover, the most unworthy of her you call Rosalind that may be chosen out of the gross band of the unfaithful. <laughs> Therefore, beware my censure and keep your promise. With no less religion than if thou wert indeed my Rosalind. So adieu. Well, time is the old justice that examines all such offenders and let time try. Adieu. You have simply misused our sex in your love, Prate. Oh, cuz, 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 my pretty little cuz. That thou didst know how many fathoms deep I am in love. I'll tell thee, Celia, I cannot be out of the sight of Orlando. I'll go find the shadow and sigh till he come. And I'll sleep. How say you, cousin? Is it not past two o'clock and here much Orlando? I warrant you with pure love that troubled brain he has ta'en his bow and arrows and he's gone forth to sleep. Good morrow, fair ones. Pray you, if you know where in the pearlies of this forest stands a sheep cot fenced about with olive trees. West of this place, down in the neighbor bottom. Are not you the owner of the house I did inquire for? It is no boast being asked to say we are. Orlando doth commend him to you both. And to that youth he calls as Rosalind, he sends this bloody napkin. Oh. Are you he? I am. What what must we understand by this? I pray you tell it. When last the young Orlando parted from you, he left a promise to return again within an hour. And pacing through the forest, chewing the food of sweet and bitter fancy, lo, what befell. Under an oak whose boughs were mossed with age, a wretched, ragged man, all grown with hair, lay sleeping on his back. Under a bush's shade, a lioness, with others all drawn dry, lay crouching, head on ground with cat-like watch, when that the sleeping man should stir. This scene, Orlando did approach the man and found it was his brother, his elder brother. Oh, I have heard him, heard him speak of that same brother, and he did render him the most unnatural that lived amongst men. And well he might so do, for well I knew he was unnatural. But to Orlando, did he leave him there food to the sucked and hungry lioness? Twice did he turn his back and purposed so, but kindness, nobler ever than revenge, made him give battle to the lioness oh. who quickly fell before him, in which hurtling from miserable slumber... I awake. Ah, oh, you, his brother. Was you he rescued? Was you that did so oft contrive to kill him? Twas I, but tis not I. I do not shame to tell you what I was, since my conversion so sweetly tastes, being the thing I am. But for the bloody napkin. By and by. He led me instantly into his cave, there stripped himself, and he had upon his arm the lioness had torn some flesh away, which all this while had bled. And now he fainted and cried in fainting upon Rosalind. Brief, I recovered him, bound up his wound. He sent me hither to tell this story that you might excuse his broken promise and to give this napkin dyed in his blood unto the shepherd youth that he in sport doth call his Rosalind. Oh, well, how now? Ganymede! Sweet Ganymede! Many will swoon when they do look on blood. There is more in it. Cousin, Ganymede! Look, he recovers. Uh, I would I were at home. We'll lead you thither. I pray you, take him by the arm. Be of good cheer, youth. You are a man. You lack a man's heart. I do so, I confess it. Uh, a body would think this was well counterfeited. I pray you tell your brother how well I counterfeited. This was not counterfeit. There is too great testimony in your complexion that it was a passion of earnest. Come, you look paler and paler. Pray you draw homewards. Good sir, go with us. the joyful day, Audrey. Tomorrow will we be married. I do desire it with all my heart, Touchstone, and I hope it is no dishonest desire to desire to be a woman of the world. A man might, if he were of a fearful heart, stagger in this attempt. For here we have no temple but the wood, no assembly but horned beasts. But what though? Courage! <laughs> Orlando, how it grieves me to see thee wear thy heart in a scarf. It is my arm, Rosalind. I thought thy heart had been wounded with the claws of a lion. Wounded it is, but with the eyes of a lady. Uh, did your brother tell you how I counterfeited a swoon when he showed me your handkerchief? Aye, 
And greater wonders than that. Oh, I know where you are. For your brother and my sister no sooner met, but they looked. No sooner looked, but they loved. They shall be married tomorrow, and I will bid the Duke to the nuptial. But, oh, how bitter a thing it is to look into happiness through another man's eyes. Why, then, tomorrow I cannot serve your turn for Rosalind. I can live no longer by thinking. I will weary you, then, no longer with idle talking. I have, since I was three years old, conversed with a magician most profound in his art and yet not damnable. If you do love Rosalind so near the heart as your gesture cries it out, when your brother marries Thea, shall you marry her? Speaks thou in sober meaning? By my life I do, which I tender dearly, though I say I am a magician. <laughs> Therefore, put you in your best array, bid your friends. For if you will be married tomorrow, you shall. And to Rosalind, if you will. I will not fail if I live. <laughs> Another flood toward, and these couples are coming to the ark. Here comes a pair of very strange beasts. Salutation and greeting to you all. Good, my lord, bid him welcome. This is the motley minded gentleman that I have so often met in the forest. He has been a courtier, he swears. If any man doubt that, let him put me to my purgation. I have trod a measure, I have flattered a lady, I have been politic with my friends, smooth with mine enemy, I have undone three tailors, I have had four quarrels, and like to have fought one. <laughs> Good, my lord, like this fellow. I like him very well. God yield you, sir. I desire you of the like. Bear your body more seeming, Audrey. <laughs> a poor virgin, sir. An ill-favored thing, sir, but mine own. A poor humor of mine, sir, to take that that no man else will. Rich honesty dwells like a miser, sir, in a poor house, as your pearl in your foul oyster. <laughs> Could you receive thy daughter? If there be truth in sight... She is my daughter. If there be truth in sight, you are my Rosalind. I'll have no father if you be not he. I'll have no husband if you be not he. Oh, my dear niece, welcome thou art to me. Even daughter, welcome in no less degree. Play music, and you, brides and bridegrooms all, with measure heaped in joy, to the measures fall. <laughs> It was a lover and his lass with a head That o'er the green corn fields did pass in springtime In springtime In springtime That only pretty ring time When birds do sing Hey, ding-a-ding-a-ding Hey, ding-a-ding-a-ding Sweet love, 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 spring The Columbia Workshop has brought you Shakespeare's As You Like It, directed by Margaret Webster and featuring Miss Webster in the role of Rosalind. Others in the cast were Kate Warriner as Celia, Eula Guy as Audrey, Wesley Addy as Orlando, Wallace Acton as Touchstone, McDonald Carey as Jacques, Dennis Hoy as the Banished Duke, Arthur Sachs as Oliver, John O'Shaughnessy as Corin, Frank Holliday as the singer. The musical portion of the production was created by Alexander Simler. Next week at the same time, the Columbia Workshop will present an original fantasy in blank verse by Joseph Liss, titled The Story of Dogtown Common. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.